Good evening, folks. Uh, tomorrow is Veterans Day. We want to thank all the uh, the veterans um, uh, for their, their their service. Uh, we can't do enough for them, and uh, I hope uh, tomorrow you're able to spend some time uh, uh, with a veteran. Unfortunately, we are losing them quick, but uh, they're tough people. They're hanging in there. Uh, our next meeting is December 1st. Uh, Curtis Fields, who who plays, um, who plays portrays uh, U.S. Grant, um, for, unfortunately, that would obviously be a better show for Hatch Auditorium, and I am going to get him back at, in uh, 2021, uh, as I've just sort of confirmed with Chris. Chris, uh, uh, also, I, I feel like we're, we're trapping him in a cage here uh, with, with this thing, but... Uh, we will definitely get him back in 21 for his act uh, on, on stage is, uh, is truly not to be missed. Uh, HR 7608, I have no good news for you. The letters that we're getting back, and I appreciate everybody sending the, uh, the uh, letters. Uh, the letters, letters that we are getting back are as disappointing as they are noncommittal. Uh, they're, 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 they're not... Uh, they're not giving much much encouragement for hope. Uh, all we can do is keep letting them know how how we feel about it, and uh, uh, hope that little sanity gets into the uh, into the uh, Congress. Okay, that's enough for the business. I do have something that I need to bring up to you. Um, we have a lot of new folks and visitors. Um, that are attending the Zoom meetings uh, that are actually not members and really don't know that much about the round table. So I, I thought I would fill you in uh, because the number is significant. Uh, we're 10 years old. Uh, we are the largest round table on the planet. Uh, we've donated over $50,000 in historic preservation over our time. Uh, we, we've taken the philosophy that we do not buy plots of land. Um, we would rather engage in local projects where we can have an impact. And uh, so far, the things that we have gotten done uh, are truly amazing. We brought an interpretation to uh, Fort Caswell with the uh, National Park Service type, uh, type layout uh, plaques, uh, the information plaques. Uh, and we may be even doing a little more uh, out there as there's some talk about a, uh, a, a museum. Uh, so I'll keep you informed about that. Uh, we, we have our meetings at Hatch Auditorium out at Fort Caswell on the east end of Oak Island. Uh, it is as much a social event as it is a lecture on the Civil War. We're going to give you some music. We're going to feed you, give you some coffee, sell you some books. Uh, and then you, you're going to be able to listen to one of the top speakers in the country. We have period musicians that come in a couple times a year. Uh, they play period songs from the Civil War in period dress with period instruments. Uh, so that is always a uh, popular night. We have three or four different acts um, that we uh, that we try to bring in. Uh, we, and we do, we get the best speakers that are possible. Our problem is that Zoom does not capture personality all that well. As our speaker tonight received a standing ovation just about every time he appears for us, and less than a handful have gotten a standing ovation. Uh, so uh, that's why I say we are going to have Chris back when he can, when he can uh, uh, be fully justified on stage where he should be. Okay, uh, when the virus hit back in March and April, we decided uh, we weren't going to be able to meet at Hatch Auditorium and that the Zoom meetings were about the best that we could do, the lesser of evils. Not knowing in April that it would last beyond December, uh, we tried to come up with sort of a short-term policy to see uh, uh, if we could pull off the Zoom meetings. Uh, it, it's been a struggle. We're learning at every at every meeting, uh, and sometimes it's not so much the Zoom programs that we that we have to deal with, but it's all the other programs to get the information out, to get the uh, recording edited, to get that uploaded to the internet. You know, it's tech tech technology stuff that a lot of us uh, aren't really used to, but we are gaining on it. We are gaining on it. We did, we, we did much better uh, this month 
Uh, and next month, I'm actually going to bring in a pro uh, that's going to give us a class to to the select uh, folks that, that are dealing with this stuff uh, so uh, that we can kind of uh, gear our questions to what our kind of specific needs are. Uh, she's very good. She's been helping us uh, all along here. But I thought it'd be a good thing for everybody to sort of take take a class and brush up. But at that time, back in March, when we decided that we were going to do the uh, the Zoom things uh, uh, in, in September, we uh, we made a decision that we weren't going to charge non-members. We weren't going to actively pursue our dues, not knowing how long this was going to last and what sort of product that we could provide you for your money. Uh, so we are into it now. Uh, December looked like a, a, a good bet for us getting back in the hatch. It wasn't. Uh, and now, frankly, I, I'm reading chicken entrails to try and determine uh, when we're going to be able to get back. But uh, it looks like it's going to be a long term. Uh, so in order to protect our, the, our dues paying members, uh, we hope that everybody that has uh, viewed the Zoom uh, events that we've had so far have enjoyed them and will eventually join our merry band. It's $25 for your family for a year. Um, and we will at some point, I don't know exactly when, that decision is not for me to make, but at some point we will not be able to offer the Zoom meetings to non-members. We have members that are actually paying dues uh, and they should get the benefit of, of our meetings uh, for, for their, their support. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed what, what, what we're doing uh, and will eventually su uh, support us. Uh, you can send your check just made out to BCWRT to P.O. Box 10161, Southport 28461. Okay, so enough of that. Tonight we are very happy to have Chris Mikowski as uh, as our speaker. Uh, little did we know when we set set this up some time ago that um, that we would, would be conducting it this way. Uh, Chris and I were just talking about the losses that the Civil War historians uh, among the Civil War historians uh, they share with. Uh, Bud Robertson, of course, Ed Bars, uh, Winston Groom uh, uh, passing away. And you wonder where are our new uh, backbone, our, 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 our new elite historians coming from? Well, in my opinion, we have one, one of, of them tonight. Uh, Chris is uh, founder of the wonderful, and if you haven't been there, definitely go there, Emerging Civil War. Uh, website. Uh, there's a lot of history there, uh, and he is also a senior editor of the award-winning uh, Emerging Civil War series uh, that is published by Savage Baby. Uh, the, these are, are very special books. Um, you're, they're, they're not going, you know, like tonight, okay, we're, uh, we're not getting a history of Gettysburg, we're getting a detailed history of a little slice of the Gettysburg uh, history. Uh, for example, the book that they put out on Grant's last days. It's not a biography on Grant's life. It, it, it is a detailed look at those last couple days. And, and that is, I've read several of these uh, on, on this list. And uh, that is by far my favorite. But uh, uh, Chris is very active in the uh, round tables. Uh, he is the chief historian, uh, historian in residence at Stevenson's Ridge, professor at the Jandoli School of Communication at St. Bonaventure in Albany, New York. Uh, and he, Chris did spend time at the National Park Service uh, at Spotsylvania and Fredericksburg Battlefield. So he is, uh, he is what uh, the historians of the 21st century should be. And, uh, and and can be. It, 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 there's a lot of computer stuff involved with it, and Chris has really incorporated that into the world of history to bring more history to more people. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a big deal. 
Uh, there are any number of books. You can go to the Emerging Civil War uh, website and see the, uh, the uh, a number of books out there. And I hard to believe that you would not find something on there of, of particular interest to you. Uh, so with without any further, uh, let me introduce Chris Mikowski. Chris, take it away. Mike, thanks so much. I am delighted to be back with my friends in Brunswick. Uh, it does, as Mike said, uh, feel a little bit constrained here, uh, trapped in the Zoom world. I'm used to roaming around on the stage, as folks are, are, uh, uh, who are familiar with my work uh, know that I kind of move around. That's so that I can avoid the fruit and tomatoes and things that people throw at me when I'm talking. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Pat DeBarros. Um, Pat has just been a wonderful with the tech end. He was trying to nail me down for a few minutes uh, earlier this week and I've had such a week and, and uh, I hope I haven't frustrated Pat too much, but he's just done yeoman's work with the technology here and I want to give Pat a special shout out and thank you for, for what he's done for us, for you, and of course for me today. Uh, Mike Powell, Ru Wally Ruckle, thank you both. Uh, nice to see both of you and I look forward to getting together with you guys in person. As Mike said, I'm part of a group known as Emerging Civil War. There are 30 of us with public history backgrounds and our mission really is to spread the gospel of the Civil War, to help people stay connected with what we believe is America's defining event. Uh, as you know, uh, if we lose contact with our own history, then we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of our predecessors. Uh, we also fail to be able to learn from the wisdom that history can offer us. And so it's really important to us to stay connected with history. And so I would love to have you as part of that conversation. Uh, we've got a blog with free content every day, www.emergingcivilwar.com. We also have an annual symposium every year, first weekend in August. This year, uh, our keynote speaker will be Gordon Ray. Fingers crossed that we'll be able to have it. We actually had to postpone last year because of COVID. Let me switch over here to screen share for just a moment so I can get our program up and going. Um, I don't normally do uh, PowerPoints, so this is kind of uh, something unusual, but I figure since I'm trapped in a computer, I might as well try to use a PowerPoint just a little bit for you. Um, before I get started, I just want to riff off something that Mike had mentioned a few moments ago, just reminding us that tomorrow is Veterans Day. And uh, I think about that when I do programs. Um, and just with the election last week, um, it's, it's really in the forefront of my mind. Um, if you voted last week, I want to say thank you. Uh, I don't want to be political, doesn't matter who you voted for, that you participated in the process is vital. Uh, the founders believed that in order for us to self-determine our own fate, our own governance, that we had to have a well-informed, vibrant uh, democracy, and the electorate had to be committed to participate in that. And when I think about stories like the one we'll talk about tonight, particularly in Gettysburg, where Lincoln showed up on the battlefield the following November and talked about those who had given their last full measure for the republic, for government, uh, of the people, by the people, and for the people, um, and, and the work that remained before them uh, at the National Cemetery. It was up to them to, to rededicate themselves. Uh, we're carrying on that work um, every time we go to the polls. And I think about all the men who died to save this country, to keep this country together, all the people on the home front who suffered and struggled and sacrificed because their fathers, their sons, their husbands, their brothers were off at the war. Um, and all the people in the years since who have struggled and, and fought to increase the franchise so that more and more people could participate in that democratic process. Um, so thank you for participating in that. And tomorrow, um, take the time to say to a veteran, thank you for what you have done to allow us to continue on that work because um, some folks had to give the last full measure. So it's a small thing to ask us to just go to the ballot box to do our part. So I uh, hope you keep that in mind uh, this Veterans Day. The program tonight is going to be based on a magazine article that my co-author Chris White and I put together. Uh, I, at the very beginning of the chat, if you go to the chat function here on the uh, Zoom call, you'll see a link to this article. It's available at Civil War Times at HistoryNet.com. So you can read that article if you're interested. Um, but to me, I came to this story, um, not because I'm necessarily a Gettysburg guy. Chris White, my co-author, is a Gettysburg guy, the former licensed battlefield guy. 
Uh, he's a Gettysburg guy. I'm a Stonewall Jackson guy. And I feel bad for poor Dick Yule because everyone's like, oh, if Jackson had been at Gettysburg, such and such and such and such would have happened. Um, and poor Dick Yule uh, gets the short end of that stick because he is Stonewall Jackson's replacement. And people on, uh, look at the action on the first day of the battle, which we'll talk about today, and say, well, gosh, if Stonewall Jackson had been there, the battle would have unfolded differently. Uh, things would have uh, been entirely different. The South would have won, blah, blah, blah. You know, the Confederacy would have gotten its independence. Um, and everyone then blames poor Dick Ewell. And one of the things I want you to, I hope, appreciate tonight is that Ewell actually made some very sound military judgments, judgment that I think would actually be very similar to what Jackson would have made had he been there. Uh, and we can talk about that in the Q&A a little bit about uh, why Jackson could never have been at Gettysburg in the first place. Um, but uh, history has been unkind to Dick Ewell mostly because he's not Stonewall Jackson. And his decision on the afternoon of July 1st, 1863, not to attack Cemetery Hill, not to attack Culp's Hill, has been, I think, the most second-guessed decision of the entire Civil War. There's a reason they call it armchair generaling. Uh, today we call it Monday morning quarterbacking, same sort of thing. And poor Dick Ewell has been second guest. He's been armchair general. He's been Monday morning quarterbacked. And I'm here to tell you tonight that uh, perhaps history has been uh, too unkind to a man who made some pretty smart decisions on the field. Let's take a look at what that field looked like. Uh, here's my essentially my one slide for tonight. It's the town of Gettysburg. This is in the afternoon of July 1st, 1863. As you know, Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia uh, is on the march, heading into Pennsylvania, trying to make something happen, bring the war out of Virginia to uh, ease pressure on the infrastructure there, ease pressure on the agricultural system, and to try to stir up political trouble for Abraham Lincoln in the North by heading up towards, say, for instance, Harrisburg, severing the rail lines there. It's a key supply depot, throwing things into turmoil. Uh, what Lee really hopes to do is uh, sow discord in the North uh, in, in an attempt to try to force the Lincoln administration to the bargaining table. Joe Hooker's commander of the Army of the Potomac, he is cautiously pursuing Lee northward. He's got his army split into two wings. Uh, he's outnumbering Lee by uh, almost 40,000 men. But Hooker's real problem isn't the Confederate Army, although that is a problem. His real enemy is Henry Halleck back in Washington. Following Hooker's defeat at the Battle of Chancellorsville in May of 1863, uh, Hooker really fell from grace. He had a direct line to Abraham Lincoln. Basically, anytime he needed something, he could go straight to Lincoln. Uh, and that was outside of the chain of command. Uh, Lincoln decides to damp that down, and he says, you've got to report to me through Halleck, who's the general in chief of the army, and through uh, Stanton, who is the secretary of defense. Uh, Hooker doesn't get along with either man. And so immediately Hooker and Halleck start bickering. They've got a long running feud that precedes the war. Uh, a lot of personal animosity between the two that dates back to Hooker's time out in California. Uh, and so uh, even as Hooker is trying to slowly advance northward after Robert and Lee's army, he's sniping back and forth with Halleck. The main bone of contention is the federal garrison at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, um, uh, at that point, it's still Virginia, but not for much longer. And uh, Hooker basically says, I need those men to be with me so I can bolster the army. And Halleck says, no, we need those men in that position to defend Washington uh, if Lee breaks loose. And so Hooker throws down the gauntlet. He says, if you don't give me those men, I'm going to turn in my resignation. And Lincoln lets him, calls the bluff, accepts Hooker's resignation, and on the 28th of June, names George Gordon Meade the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, up to that point, Meade is a, a corps commander in the Army. He's relatively unknown outside his own Fifth Corps, but the men who do know him respect him deeply. In fact, several of them recommended uh, Meade for promotion. Uh, men who are more senior than him step aside to let me ascend. Part of that is because they respect me so much. Part of that is because they recognize that the command of this army has been a political hot potato. They don't want to deal with it. John Reynolds, for instance, he doesn't want to deal with it. So they let me assume command. So Meade 
takes command, even as his army is on the move northward, he's trying to figure out how his army is deployed across the the countryside, trying to figure out where the Confederates are. He's got Jeb Stuart, the commander of the Federal Cavalry, riding around somewhere in his rear. That's not intentional on Stuart's part. Stuart is cut off. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, so Meade is trying to get a read on this situation, uh, even as the Confederates are threatening his home state of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is really key because with the uh, elections coming up in 64, uh, control of the state legislature will determine the balance of uh, how things go in the Senate and House of Representatives in Washington for Lincoln. Uh, the political support that Governor Curtin offers is vital. Uh, Pennsylvania is one of the largest suppliers of troops. So Pennsylvania is a very important state for Lincoln's overall coalition. And to have the Confederates suddenly tromping around there is a huge problem for him. Meade as a Pennsylvania guy himself, uh, leading the army in to defend his home state. Confederates have such a jump that they get all the way to the door of Harrisburg. Um, in fact, there used to be a monument up until this summer that was just outside of the city in Mechanicsburg that showed the farthest advance of the Confederate Army. Uh, Confederate cavalry gets kind of up into the hills, into some of the mountain gaps. They get to the banks of the river, looking at Harrisburg across the river. But even as they uh, start knocking under the command of Richard Yule, the second corps commander, um, they get a message from Lee saying they need to pull back. Lee has his army split into two wings, and Ewell has been kind of the flying vanguard, very much in the spirit of Stonewall Jackson, who would go on these wide sweeping missions, uh, hitting the Federal Army in the flank, acting as an independent force. Thus far in the campaign, Richard Ewell has performed splendidly with a big victory out at Winchester, Virginia, bold moves to get him all the way to Harrisburg, and then suddenly, wait, time out, pull back. The reason Lee decides to consolidate is because the rest of his army is pinned up just outside of Gettysburg, out here, if we were to follow the Chambersburg Pike out over to the mountains uh, into uh, the, the Cumberland Valley. And uh, Lee realizes that the Federals finally are onto him. They're moving aggressively to try to intercept him. And so Lee wants to consolidate. As he looks at his map, he looks at Gettysburg here. One of the myths is that he looks at Gettysburg and sees shoes. There are no shoes in Gettysburg. In fact, part of the Confederate Army had been through here on the 26th. They'd cleaned out what few shoes there were. There were a couple cobblers in town, but there was no massive stash of shoes. It's become part of the Gettysburg myth. What Lee sees when he looks at this are all of these roads it's going to give him, and not just this roads, which is Robert Roads, but all of these roads in and out of town. This provides plenty of opportunity for movement and maneuver. So if he can consolidate his position into town and gain the advantage of that road network, um, that's going to give him a lot of options to either continue his campaign, to retreat safely, to outflank the Federals. Uh, so that's why he's really eyeing Gettysburg. But as he begins to advance, down the Chambersburg Pike with his third corps under A.P. Hill in the lead. He tells his army, don't bring on a general engagement. Until the army is concentrated, he does not want to get into a massive fight because he can't get everyone onto the field. And he knows that the Federals outnumber him and they've got um, uh, some, uh, some better position, particularly because they'll be coming up from the south. It's a race to the town. He wants to get there without bringing on that big fight, then concentrate, then he can choose his ground. Part of the problem, though, is because three quarters of his, of his excuse me, two thirds of his army are coming down the Chambersburg Pike, that creates a bottleneck. Federal Cavalry under John Buford, also looking at this area, sees the advantage of this road network understands that the Confederates are out here someplace. And if he can block the road in here someplace, he can bottle them up and allow the Federals time to come in from both the uh, East and the South to converge here and choose some high ground and then invite battle. So it becomes this race for the ground. And Buford with his cavalry does deploy across a series of ridges out here, actually starting off our map uh, up in this direction. And basically Buford's job is to just hold on and delay while he calls for reinforcements from the infantry. Uh, John Reynolds' first corps is gonna be the person he calls on. Reynolds is gonna come up from the south in this direction, even as Buford falls back from one ridge to the next, to the next, to the next, all the while delaying the advance 
of the Confederates. Confederates, again, as I mentioned, I can't stress this enough, under orders not to bring on a general engagement. But because of uh, the uh, Southern temperament of Henry Heath, who is the lead division commander in Hill's uh, Third Corps, his dander gets up and he's not gonna let a bunch of cavalrymen hold him back. And so what he decides to do is he's gonna push them off that ridge and he's gonna take that road and he's gonna get into that town. But the cavalry continues to delay, so Heath deploys more, and he tries to outflank the Confederates, or excuse me, tries to outflank the Federals who hop on their horses and just ride back to the next ridge. Buford is doing all he can to hold on, waiting for that infantry, which does come up from the south, cuts through the town, and then begins to deploy here uh, along uh, McPherson's Ridge. As they do so, the Confederates realize that now they're no longer up against just uh, cavalry. They've got stronger resistance from some infantry, so he feeds more men into the fight to try to drive the Federals off that ridge before they can really establish themselves. So we see how this fight then begins to take on a life of its own as he feeds more men in, thinking that just a few more men are going to drive the Federals away. But the Federals keep throwing more reinforcements in, uh, keep resisting, so the fighting gets extremely intense in this area through here as he continues to extend his lines in both direction and the Federal First Corps takes on this ridge. John Reynolds leading his men into battle will be shot and killed there in uh, McPherson Woods. Uh, he becomes one of the highest ranking generals of the Union Army killed during the war. Not the highest ranking, but one of the highest ranking. And so uh, command is going to devolve to his uh, most senior division commander, uh, which is Admiral Doubleday, the man who did not invent baseball. And Doubleday really uh, has his best day of the war, and he is directing reinforcements, getting people into place where they need to. He really doesn't skip a beat, and I don't think he gets enough credit for what happens there, in part because he has a, a bitter falling out with Meade. Uh, politically, they're going to have some real problems after this battle. But Doubleday does a solid job of uh, continuing on with what Reynolds sets up. All the while, they're looking for more reinforcements because they are feeling the pressure. As Lee continues to push, he th throws in more men. Robert E. Lee, meanwhile, way back up at the Cash Town Inn, hears the sound of this escalating battle and wonders what's going on. And he rides to his third corps commander, uh, A.P. Hill, and he says, what's going on up at the front? Hill doesn't know. Now imagine telling your boss that. It's like, mm, yeah, it sounds like there's a fight. I don't really know what's going on with my men. I suppose I could find out. And, you know, Lee kind of gives him the icy stare. Hill goes off to find out what's going on. And Lee realizes that already things seem to be snowballing beyond his control. So Hill's men will continue to feed into this fight, continuing to deploy, trying to push the Federals off here. Meanwhile, the, uh, um, there are going to be more Confederates that are going to come onto the field up here. Uh, men, I mentioned earlier that Richard Ewell's 2nd Corps had reached Harrisburg, some 20 miles to the north of our map. They've been recalled to Gettysburg, and so they're basically going to come straight south. Uh, they're going to take a couple parallel roads so that they can uh, not create a bottleneck of their own. As a result, that's going to bring Robert Rhodes onto the field right up here in a place called Oak Hill. The First Corps is going to extend in this direction toward a place along a place called Oak Ridge, but then Rhodes men basically show up on their flank and start to pummel them with artillery, and that's going to make uh, the First Corps uh, pretty vulnerable in this area. Rhodes is going to deploy his men, and uh, the First Corps is going to try to resist. Well, as they do, the 11th Corps comes onto the field and they're going to deploy across this area here. Now for those of you who have been to Gettysburg know that this piece of high ground dominates this plain down here. This is a wide open flat plateau that sits uh, about 100 or 150 feet below this high ground up here. Pardon my uh, uh, zoom controls up there at the top of the map. So as a result, the 11th Corps finds themselves in pretty vulnerable position, even as they're trying to protect the 1st Corps' flank. When Rhodes then sweeps forward, he's going to have a series of uncoordinated attacks. Um, his men are going to come to grief out in that field, but... Uh, he's the largest uh, division in the third, excuse me, in the second corps. So just his sheer weight of numbers is going to cause some problems for the Federals 
up in that area who are now doing a two front defense, holding off heat this way, trying to hold off roads in that direction. And at this point, Robert E. Lee comes to the battlefield and he sees what's going on. He recognizes that the things are beyond his control, but it looks like his men do have some advantages and he decides to let things play out. He feels like things um, are out of his hands at this point anyway. Uh, he couldn't call things back, couldn't call this off even if he wanted to. As a result of the pressure up here, um, the uh, second corps under uh, the second corps division under Rhodes is going to be here, and then another second corps division is going to deploy behind a ridge line over here, and that's going to be under Jubal Early, the irascible old man, uh, is known as Lee's bad old man, the only man in the army who's known to swear in front of Robert E. Lee. Everyone else is too afraid to. Early is too irascible. He doesn't care. And as he deploys his men um, behind a ridge line this way, he's going to then sweep forward with tremendous overwhelming force and hit the Federals in the flank. Now, I want to point out that these men, as some of you know, are members of the Union 11th Corps, commanded by Major General Oliver Otis O.O. Howard. Uh, he gets that nickname, uh-oh, because two months earlier, Chancellorsville, his 11th Corps, had been on the far right flank of the army, had been pounced on by Stonewall Jackson on May 2nd, 1863, and rolled up, uh, nearly leading to complete catastrophe for the Union Army. They do hold on, and they have a slugfest on May 3rd. Howard wants to keep that fight going at Chancellorsville to redeem his shattered reputation. Uh, now he finds himself once more on the flank of the Union Army deployed across this field, and he's got the same Second Corps ready to pounce on him. It's like deja vu all over again. Howard, though, has learned an important lesson, and when he deployed his 11th Corps across this field, he actually left uh, one division back here on Cemetery Hill. And uh, recognizing that uh, this is great ground, this is a good defensive position that he can rally around. So if things go uh, poorly out here, his men can fall back to Cemetery Hill, consolidate and resist any further attempts. So even as his position here does begin to collapse and his men fall back, they've got a rallying point. When the 11th Corps gives way, that opens up the right flank here for the uh, First Corps, and they're going to have to pull back this way through the town, and they collapse as well. So after a full day of fighting, Hill's men here begin to push this direction. Up here, we've got the 2nd Corps pushing in this direction, Federals falling back to consolidate here. Uh, south of the town, in a place called Cemetery Hill. Um, the ground out here had been great. This ground is probably even better. Uh, that's why Howard uh, located it. So Howard does have the distinction of being on the right flank of the army at two consecutive battles where his corps does collapse. His reputation historically will never recover, uh, but he actually does a fairly decent job of holding this defense. Uh, when his corps gets transferred out west in the fall, um, he'll perform uh, very well. He's a very solid commander. He takes instruction very well. And the 11th Corps will redeem its reputation fighting under William T. Sherman uh, for the rest of the war. Uh, Howard will actually be elevated to army command uh, because of the effectiveness that he does. Not a lot of razzle-dazzle. He'll never be considered one of the most awesome, sexiest, fabulous uh, generals in the Union Army, but he is solid and uh, performs well. He plays well with others, I think is a good way to say it. But as the army begins to consolidate here, and the Second Corps, the Confederate Second Corps comes into town, and it's about five o'clock when Richard Ewell finally arrives on the scene. Ewell's a 46-year-old West Point graduate of the class of 1840. He graduated 13 out of 42. So, you know, kind of upper middle, uh, hadn't, you know, performed spectacularly well um, in the pre-war army, but also um, did a pretty solid service. Early in the war, he is... Um, uh, detailed off to serve under Stonewall Jackson. He is convinced Jackson is absolutely out of his mind, thinks Jackson is crazy, and then Jackson starts winning, and then Ewell's like, oh, maybe he's not so crazy after all. But the important thing that Ewell learns from working with Jackson, two things actually. One, very um, aggressive nature, and, and Ewell himself is a pretty aggressive commander. Um, but working for Jackson, who in many ways is aggression personified, Ewell really um, starts to appreciate the, the uh, uh, what 
what being offensive minded can do and how you can mystify the enemy, as Jackson says. Um, and so uh, you will really adopt that kind of aggressive mindset. Secondly, and this is even more important for our story right here, is that Jackson's command style is explicit and secretive. He tells his subordinates what they need to know when they need to know it. He doesn't tell them any sooner and he doesn't tell them any more. And he expects them to carry out his orders to the letter. It's not their job to think independently when it comes to their orders. Jackson lives a very black and white life when it comes to that. And so he's going to say, I want you to do this at this particular time and carry it out this way. And then a, a commander can use his discretion in how to carry that out. But orders should not be questioned. You don't need to know your part in the larger plan. This is what I need you to do. So that specificity that you will then kind of comes of age under is going to really affect his attitudes about command, how to be commanded and how to give commands. So I want you to keep that in mind as we get into this next part of the story. He's used to being given explicit instructions with dire consequences if you don't follow. Jackson court-martialed a number of his subordinates for not following orders. Um, he had several folks arrested. He was in constant Con, uh, constant feuding with AP Hill, for instance. So um, that's the mindset that Ewell has. Uh, Lee, as a commander, has a very different command style than Jackson. Lee would like to say, here's kind of what I want to have happen. You get my drift? And then Jackson would be like, yes, and he would carry it out. Um, it's a very different suggestive leadership style than the very prescriptive leadership style of Jackson. So when Ewell comes into town at about five o'clock, things are in disarray. Um, there's still some street fighting going on. Federal artillery up here is pounding the town. Uh, Ewell's trying to get a read on the situation, see what's going on. And uh, about that time, he comes across John Brown Gordon, one of his brigade commanders who serves under Early. And Gordon says, we really ought to attack this hill up here before they have the chance to get consolidated. Shortly thereafter, Ewell comes across Gordon's boss, uh, uh, Jubal Early. And Early says, yeah, we really ought to press, the, press forward, press the attack. At this time, Ewell gets an order a, a, a verbal order from Walter Taylor that comes from Robert E. Lee that says, press the attack if practicable. And uh, Ewell says, okay, you know what? I want to get ready to launch this attack. But if I do that, I need some help over here from AP Hill. If I just go straight in, I'm going to get chopped up. So if Hill puts some pressure over here, that's going to then alleviate some of the concern I'm going to have coming straight on. Well, then Ewell gets a reply from Hill saying, my men have been fighting all day. They're exhausted. They're discombobulated. They're disorganized. I don't think I can give you any support. So then Ewell realizes if he's going to have to make this attack, he's going to have to make it on his own. Then he gets a messenger that comes all the way from out here on his flank. And it comes from one of his brigadiers, Extra Billy Smith. William Smith, who is the governor-elect of the state of Virginia, which is Ewell's hometown, or home state. It's uh, Jubal Early's home state. So even though Smith is just a brigadier general, Early and Ewell both kind of defer to him because of the political power that Smith has. Smith has been governor once before um, because of the kickbacks that he received from giving out postal contracts. Uh, he got the name extra Billy, because you had to provide a little extra for Billy out of your, uh, out of your fees and, and duties that you're collecting. And he just has been elected for now a second term. Um, Virginia law, a weird little sidebar, um, pro prohibits consecutive terms. You can only uh, serve as Virginia once, but you can do it again later. And so this is Billy Smith's later. Billy Smith out here has seen some Federals and he's nervous that there might be components of the Union Army coming in from the East. And so Ewell, rather than launching this attack, has got to figure out what's going on out here. He can't 
push forward and leave his left flank exposed because, of course, that's a recipe for disaster. So he tells Early, go out there and find out what's going on. Um, Early goes out, does some reconnaissance, a place called Benner's Hill, which is outside of town here. Here we go right here. Um, doesn't see anything, thinks that Billy Smith is being um, uh, a little too excitable, but because it's Billy Smith, you can't just blow him off. And so he's going to actually then detail Smith's entire brigade to block the road out here. And he's going to give John Brown Gordon's brigade uh, out here also as reinforcements. So as a result, two of Early's uh, brigades are going to be out here. So now that's going to make uh, Ewell's attack under strength. Early has suffered about 500 casualties uh, up to this point in the fight, so his men still, he's still got a lot of firepower left to him. In the meantime, Robert Rhodes, he suffered about 2,500 casualties out of all of his fighting, very intense fighting up through here over the course of the day. So as uh, Ewell then starts to contemplate what his options are, maybe he shouldn't just attack straight here. Uh, this view from Benner's Hill shows a place here called Culp's Hill. And there's nobody on Culp's Hill at this point. And Ewell says, well, Early, why don't you go capture that hill out there? And that will make this position untenable. And Early starts, ah, him and hawing, I can't do it. My men are fought out. They're exhausted. I'm under strength. Dang it. And they turn to Rhodes and like, you know, Rhodes, he's had you know, five times as many casualties. His men are very confused and uh, have lost a lot of their unit cohesion in the town itself. He's not in any condition to carry this out. So they're going to turn to the other division commander, uh, Edward Allegheny Johnson. But Johnson's bringing his men in from the West. They're caught in the bottleneck that Lee had out here. So it's going to take him an extra hour, hour and a half to even get his men onto the battlefield and deployed to be able to attack this hill. By the time he does, Federals have also recognized that this hill has been open and lead elements of the 12th Corps are then going to position themselves and get up onto this hill and deny it to Ewell. So by the time Ewell does launch an attack later on um, and make some probes, he's going to have strong defense waiting for him up here and the opportunity to take this position to drive the Federals away is going to disappear as more Federal reinforcements arrive from the south and the east, filling in up here. Another key person that arrives at this point is Winfield Scott Hancock. He's the commander of the Union Second Corps. Um, he's sent as Meade's on-the-field designee to take charge of the situation. Even though Howard outranks him, Meade doesn't trust Howard. This is two, two battles in a row. Howard has lost the flank. So Hancock shows up, uh, Hancock the Superb, and he begins to help placements. He actually works very well with Howard, and the two of them sort of have this grudging um, truce with each other as they place uh, the, the units on the landscape and really deny Confederates any opportunity to drive them out. So ever after, the question has been, what if Yule had taken that hill? And by that hill, we could either be talking about Cemetery Hill or Culp's Hill. Uh, because of course, as we know, Lee goes on to lose this battle. And so the tantalizing what if exists. What if Yule had captured these positions? Would Lee have been able to win this battle after all? It must be Ewell's fault, right? And here's where we sort of forget all of the actions that are going on in the field. For instance, we forget about Billy Smith out here saying, hey, I think I have seen uh, some troops out here. Uh, and in fact, he did. Nobody seems to remember. We can see over here, Alpheus Williams, a division in the Union 12th Corps. Henry Slocum's 12th Corps starts to come onto the field led by Williams and as they get into position here Smith's men see them. That's what raises the alarm. In fact the uh, lead unit, uh, the lead brigade under uh, Thomas Ruger actually starts to deploy here along the foot of the hill and then they're there for like 15 minutes and they get an order from Williams to withdraw because of all the action that's happening here, they wanna pull back and consolidate and they'll end up taking over Culp's Hill. So these guys are here for all of 15 minutes, just long enough to raise the alarm for Smith. By the time Early comes out, he doesn't see anything. 
But in fact, Alpheus Williams reports seeing Confederate officers over on Benner's Hill. So the Federals see the Confederates, even if the Confederates don't see the Federals. Um, so the, the threat to Ewell's left flank was credible. It was real. A lot of people also forget that Stonewall Jackson, anytime he was able to uh, launch an offensive, whether he was doing his flank attack, whether it was uh, you know on the field someplace in the valley, he always undertook extensive reconnaissance. He got burned at the first battle of Kernstown early in the Valley campaign because he didn't have sufficient intelligence. And he learned from that lesson and he always, always, always got as much information as he could, always looking out for his flanks. So I think Jackson would have done the exact same thing you all did. Let's go out and find out what's out there on the flank rather than just go charging in. So Ewell made a sound decision protecting his flank. Let's also remember Jackson took that to such a, uh, to such heart that remember he was actually shot by his own men while conducting reconnaissance for a flank attack at Transversville. Um, so, you know, he put himself in harm's way to gather that information. That's how important uh, that kind of reconnaissance was to him. So Ewell, um, uh, again, doing the, the smart thing, doing the prudent thing, and gets criticized for it instead of going straight in. The other thing we have to remember, and everyone likes to whip out that phrase, if practicable, you know, oh, Stonewall Jackson would have found it practicable to take that hill. The phrase, if practicable, doesn't actually show up anywhere in writing until Lee writes his after action report in January of 64. So it's six months after the battle. Everything that we have up to that point is hearsay. Um, Walter Taylor delivers a set of verbal orders. Nothing is written down. Uh, more orders come to Yule. So we don't even know if, if uh, um, that Lee even uttered those words. But let's take a look at what Ewell actually, or what uh, Lee actually wrote in his report. Okay, and the context here is important. So I'm gonna put the whole quote up. Uh, I will read it for folks who uh, can't read well uh, on their computer screens. Without information as to its proximity, the strong position which the army had assumed could not be attacked without danger of exposing the four divisions present already weakened and exhausted by a long and bloody struggle to overwhelming numbers of fresh troops. General Ewell was therefore instructed to carry the hill occupied by the enemy if he found it practicable, but to avoid a general engagement until the arrival of the other divisions of the army, which were to hasten forward. Okay. Now, if we think about the full context of that quote, Lee realizes Ewell doesn't have full information about where the enemy is or how strong they are. Lee recognizes that Ewell's divisions are fought out after a long and bloody struggle and would be facing fresh troops. And most importantly, don't bring on a general engagement. And then this last part, till other divisions of the army hasten forward, and Ewell's already been told by Hill, I'm not sending you other divisions. So if we look at the full context of what Lee says, based on all of that, based on Ewell's training from Jackson to take explicit, not general suggestive orders, Ewell makes a perfectly reasonable decision not to assault that hill. And a lot of people will say, well, Jackson would have done it. I don't think so. I think Jackson would have made the same choices that Ewell did under these same sorts of uh, circumstances. Uh, maybe he would have had stronger words for A.P. Hill. But then again, and this gets back into the, you know, Jackson would, could never have been there in the first place. The armies might not have ever been to Gettysburg in the first place because there wouldn't have been a third corps if Jackson hadn't been wounded. It's Jackson's wounding that causes Lee to reorganize the army in the first place. So maybe Jackson would have just told Hill, do this. You know, who can tell? It's easy to point the finger at Richard Yule. Um, but in fact, there are so many variables here and so many of them get forgotten about and overlooked and brushed over because, of course, Lee can't be wrong. He can't be at fault, even though he himself, at the end of day three, says it's all my fault. He can't be at fault. So 
The lost cause mythology that rises after the war looks for ways to pin the blame on other people. Jeb Stewart for being cut off. James Longstreet for a lot of his uh, strong opinions about July 2nd. And of course, Richard Yule for not attacking. What really makes this or what really crystallizes this in the popular imagination is the scene from the movie Gettysburg. And let me shift over here. It's, uh, one of my absolute favorite uh, uh, movie scenes, and all of us who are Civil War fans are all familiar with this. There's no pent up extra report. The enemy is falling back, sir. They're on the run. Very well, Lieutenant. General Early says the enemy's caved in on the left flank and heading back to Gettysburg. They're all running. Well, uh, thank you, Corporal. Henry, sir. I want you to find General Hill's chief of Artillery, sir. Tell him I'm on fire, placed on that hill as much fire as possible. Yes, sir. Very well. Major Taylor, this summer, I want you to deliver this message in person. Find General Hugh and tell him the federal troops are withdrawn in confusion. It is only necessary to push those people in order to gain possession of those heights. Tell him to take that hill if practicable. The one beyond the town. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, sir. Very well. Ah! knows we should have taken it. There was no one there, no one there at all, and it commanded the town. General Gordon saw it. I mean, he was with us. Me and Ewell and Gordon all standing there in the dark like fat great idiots with that bloody damned hill empty. I beg your pardon, General. That bloody damned hill has been... Well, as God is my witness... We were all there. I said to him, General Ewell, we have got to take that hill. General Jackson would not have stopped like this with the blue bellies on the run and there was plenty of life left on a hill like that empty. Oh, God help us. I, I don't know what... I don't know why I... Do please continue, General. Yes, sir. Sir... I said to him, General Yule, these words. I said to him, Sir, give me one division and I will take that hill. He said nothing. He just stood there and he stared at me. I said, General Yule, give me one brigade and I will take that hill. I was becoming disturbed. And General Yule put his arms behind him and blinked. So I said, General, give me one regiment and I will take that hill. And he said nothing. He just stood there. I threw down my sword down on the ground in front of him. Really? We could have done it, sir. A blind man should have seen it. Now they're working up there. You can hear the axes of the federal troops. So in the morning, many a good boy will die taking that hill. And of course, it's a super compelling scene from the movie Gettysburg. And uh, let's see if I can get my screen share back here. Oh, here we go. Uh, William Shepard Morgan's portrayal, fantastic. Um, he's uh, portraying uh, Isaac Trimble in the film. Isaac Trimble was a senior officer attached to Yule, didn't have a command. So Lee said, just go with Yule, hang out with him until an opportunity arises. Um, at one point, as all the confusion was going on, Trimble said, let's go take that hill. And Yule says, uh, generally, when I want the opinion of a junior officer, I'll ask for it. 
And that offended Trimble so much that he will spend his entire post-war career trying to tear down Ewell uh, because of that comment. Shepherd, uh, uh, William Morgan Shepard's portrayal uh, really cements that for us in the modern age um, and uh, because it's so compelling. And Ewell doesn't get a rebuttal in the movie. We hear this fantastic scene from Morgan and Ewell gets nothing. And so we get one side of that story, which further cements this uh, lost cause narrative that points the finger uh, at Ewell. Um, so all these different factors come into play that really have uh, cast Yule in a very negative light when in fact Yule's only real crime is he's not Stonewall Jackson. Uh, and for that, his decisions at Gettysburg have been second guessed for almost 160 years. Hopefully tonight I've given you a few things to think about um, so that maybe you're not quite so hard on Dick Ewell. And if you were in his position, um, perhaps you too might have made some decisions that uh, might leave you open to second guessing as well. And on that note, I thank you very much. I'll be glad to answer whatever questions you have. Um, and thanks for your patience as I've been confined to the Zoom screen. Mike. Thank you, Chris. That was excellent for a guy stuck in a box. That was not bad at all. Trust me. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, if I could get you to hang on for just one minute. Uh, I usually forget to do the 50-50 drawing, but today I forgot to do the uh, uh, election uh, announcements. Uh, I'm going to put Gifford on. Uh, Gifford uh, Stack will go on for just a second here, and then we will get directly to the questions. Uh, Chris, I'm already seeing... Uh, some things come over uh, the uh, chat that says clap, clap, clap. <laughs> uh, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's get to some questions. Not too many questions. Um, I've got a couple things I, 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 I'd love, like to bring up. Um, Chris, how much do you think the uh, terrain there at Culp's Hill, I, I'm sure you've been up there to see it. I mean, you could practically stand up on top of that thing and roll rocks down, down on them, uh, and especially to try and get up there with uh, with fading light. Uh, how much do you think that may have played a part? Certainly the terrain at Culp's Hill um, would have been problematic, and, and it proves to be problematic when the Union actually extends its line out there and the, the Confederates do have to assault that beginning on the 2nd of July. Um, it's steep, it's rocky, uh, but more importantly, the approaches to it are pretty open, which allows some of the artillery on top of Culp's Hill to really sweep those fields. So it's really hard to even approach. Um, so uh, the, the Confederates do continue to try to wrap around and outflank the position and are able to kind of get up uh, into some of the, the boulders. So there are some, uh, you know, some pretty intense fighting up in there. Um, but the train is, is what allows a single brigade under Pat Green to hold the line on the 2nd of July as most other federal forces are stripped away to, uh, to bolster other parts uh, against Longstreet's attack. Train is, is the key at Culp's Hill for the federals being able to hold it. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, another thing that uh, I'd, I'd, I'd li like to uh, ask you about the old maxim is generally to disperse on the march and concentrate for the battle. And here we have Yule getting in position in the right time, in the right space, and Hill's in the right position in the right time, in the right space. It just seems like such a disappointment that you did the hard, you've done the hard part. You've gotten <laughs> those guys everywhere they're supposed to be in the right time and in the right place, and then to not pull the trigger. Uh, do you think, um, you, you had, had lost the leg and that was what, uh, the group of ten, uh, second Manassas. Yeah. Second Manassas. Right. Um, do you think some of the fire may have gone, uh, gone out of you after that, that time, he may not have been quite as aggressive as he was before that. I mean, losing, losing, losing the leg, it may be a little trauma there. Yeah. Certainly some of his subordinates thought so. Um, his wife, actually comes back to the army with him and uh, attends to him. He rides around in a carriage. Um, when he is on horseback, he has to be strapped in because he doesn't have a second leg to help hold him onto the horse. Uh, so there are a number of those sorts of, of factors. And he finds religion too, and, uh, which is something he started to inherit from Jackson. So uh, a lot of people point to those sorts of figures. Um, I don't uh, necessarily attribute it to that though. If you look at uh, his 
actions at the beginning of the campaign as the army's moving up the Shenandoah Valley. He pounces on uh, Winchester in convincing faction. Um, he's so successful there, driving uh, banks out of there that uh, um, they actually start talking about Ewell as the next Jackson. You know, it's like he is the second coming of Jackson. We, we found a replacement. So there's a great deal of enthusiasm for Dick Ewell um, among his men up to that point. I think it really has a lot to do with just, uh, uh, you know, Lee does not give explicit orders. Um, Ewell responds well to explicit orders. So I think that that made a difference. And, uh, you know, uh, Hill is not especially aggressive either. This all kind of comes back to the fact that this is Lee's first time using this army since Jackson's wounding and the reorganization into three corps. So Lee is still figuring out how to use this army, how to coordinate with his corps commanders. They're trying to figure out how to work with each other, how to work with Lee. So that's, I think, really just the learning curve. Another fact we sort of forget about is Stuart's absence. Um, Stuart gets roundly criticized for for not being around, not providing information. Had he been there, he would have been the one out on the, uh, the Confederate left flank providing screening and intelligence. Um, so you would not have had to dispatch two entire brigades out there to guard his flank. Um, so that's also a key factor here too. So I'm not trying to make excuses for him necessarily, but there's just so many things at work here. Uh, it's easy to stereotype and point fingers when in fact uh, we really have lots of stuff to consider. Sure. Uh, 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 one of our members brought up the, the fatigue factor uh, for Yule's troops. They had they, they'd been marching now for quite some time. Uh, how many hours did they, did they have, have prior to the fight in, in, in the late afternoon there? How not many? Not much. What how many, how, uh, many hours how many hours did they have to fight prior to the late afternoon? Road shows up around 12, 1230. Um, so he's basically fighting for five hours. Um, uh, early shows up by three. Um, everybody's sweeping into town by five. Johnson's not getting into town until closer to sunset. So he's not really able to, uh, to be a factor in, uh, in yeah. uh, clearing the terrain at all. Um, and that's after they've all marched down. Okay, for, like, and one Carolina final Island. question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, one final question. The shoes issue. Boy, that's like the bad pain that won't go away. It's like Lincoln writing the uh, Gettysburg Address on the train, right? Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that? What was the, what was the, the uh, do we know the origin of that story? I think yeah, part of it just goes back to that hard scrabble Confederates. They need supplies, uh -huh. um, you know, and sort of the romanticized idea of what the Confederate foot soldier was going through. Yeah, um, Early had been through Gettysburg on June 26th as he moves to the east over toward York and uh, the Susquehanna River and is supposed to approach Harrisburg from the uh, southeast. Um, so he'd been through Gettysburg. He'd not only swept yeah. out all the shoes, but, you know, any provisions. Anything else they could use. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, listen, Chris, thank you very much, man. I, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I will get with you soon and we'll, we'll uh, check your 2021 calendar uh, and get you back on stage and out of that box. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. Same to you, buddy. Take care. Appreciate it. Thanks.